This was a trip that I took as part of uh, an Iowa State Alumni Association trip. The travel company that organized it was called Go Hagen Travel. And uh, as you can see, the title uh, of the trip itself was Island Life in Ancient Greece. And all of the sites that we stopped at and saw specifically were World Heritage Sites. I do want to say as I start out, if you have questions as we go along, I'd be glad to try and answer them. There are a few folks on Zoom. So if uh, you have a question, I'll repeat the question so they can be sure to hear it. This is the area that we traveled and I don't know a good way to show exactly where we went because we started at Athens and the names here are in Greek and in parentheses, the English, and the Aegean Sea has hundreds of islands and we visited six. So um, we kind of started from there and went around this way. Oh, it was a clockwise circle. There was a, most of the trip was a cruise. There was a two day pre-cruise uh, experience in Athens, which I did sign up for, and I thought was really neat. The hotel that we stayed at had a eighth floor restaurant where we had breakfast. And the first morning I went up for breakfast and this was the site that I saw, which was just awesome. This is the Acropolis and the restaurant had one of the best views in the city, I thought. So this was where we started from. Uh, one of the things that I learned is Acropolis just means the highest part of the city and all Greek cities have an Acropolis. So it's not just that only Athens has an Acropolis, but they're all over the country. To um, part of the time in the city, we did go over to the Acropolis and we were bust across the city and this is the Parthenon. That's one of the buildings on the Acropolis. Um, we had the bus parked at the bottom of the hill and we had to walk up. So one of the things they warned people about was be sure you have good sturdy shoes and that you can go up and down rough stairs, which was certainly good advice. And it was very crowded. This is, um, Part of this I want to point out and we'll refer to later on the part to the right that is um, inside the uh, Parthenon where you can see different colors of marble. That's part of the restoration and also part of something I want to talk about a little bit later. The um, Acropolis has a museum and one of the things that I bought while I was there is this uh, Acropolis Museum book, which is really interesting. But then I decided, because it is also very heavy, that I probably wouldn't be able to complete the journey if I bought a museum book at every stop. So unfortunately, I don't have any other main purchases. I was going to stop in London on my way back to see my son and his wife and had a few things for them, but I had limited suitcase space. When uh, my husband and I used to travel quite a bit and when we did, we always tried to learn a bit of the local language, trying not to be the ugly American. And so I tried before this trip to learn a little bit of Greek. And I tried books, which have uh, kind of pronunciation guides. I tried Duolingo and was getting kind of confused when I heard from someone that Greek is one of the most difficult languages to learn. And at that point I thought, okay, <laughs> I will give up. I actually remember two words that I'd learned. One is Kalamera, which we heard every day because it means good morning. So everybody in the restaurant and the crew and and uh, fellow travelers always said Calamera to everybody first thing in the morning. I also learned, also learned F Caristo, which means thank you. And that's the extent of my Greek. 
one of the things I did think was interesting because um, being a scientist and those of you who are mathematicians, a lot of the Greek alphabet is used for symbols in these fields. And so in signs or uh, printed material that were written in Greek, I recognized the letters. I just didn't know how to pronounce them. And a surprising to me number of words in English actually are very closely related to Greek words. So sometimes I could actually understand what a sign said. The Parthenon, getting back to the picture, is uh, originally con was originally constructed, constructed in the fifth century BCE, before the Christian era. And it held a statue of Athena, which was apparently very, very large and was encrusted with pearls and gold. And the first time Athens was overrun by other tribes, the statue was looted and disappeared. So there have been some attempts at replicating it. There are some pictures imagining what it must have looked like, but it did not last very long. The other items, and I mentioned some of these uh, different colored blocks up here, you've probably all heard about the Elgin marbles. And I looked into that a little bit more, and it's a more complex story than I realized, because the uh, Parthenon, having been um, destroyed and rebuilt a number of times, and in the 1800s, was not in very good shape and was even being uh, looted for stone to break up and use for roads or for other construction projects. And so the British ambassador to Greece, Lord Elgin, was trying to save some of it. And so he took, the uh, Greeks say, stole some of the pieces from the area and they are now in the British Museum, where I have seen them. Uh, the Greeks do not call them the Elgin marbles. And there are petitions to get them returned. And even my family, my son is married to a British woman, even they agree that probably these materials should be returned. One of the things I had thought about getting a picture of and had a hard time figuring out how to do it, so I don't have a good picture, is a display that's in this Acropolis Museum. Uh, it's a reproduction of this Acropolis and the frieze that's along the top. And they left blank spaces where the pieces are missing because they're in London. So that's what they would like to have returned. This is a building off to the side of the Parthenon. It's called the, and here I'm not sure my pronunciation is very good, Erichtheon. The most interesting part, I think, are is the pillars that support the porch to the side. They are called karyatids, and they're actually pillars that support the roof, carved always to look like women, just to make it more decorative. These statues here are actually reproductions, and of the six pieces, five of them are in the Acropolis Museum, the originals, and one is in the British Museum in London. This is the hotel where we stayed when we were in Athens. It's called the Hotel Grand Breton, one of the finest hotels in uh, Athens. And one of the things I like about tours is we stay places that I probably couldn't have afforded to be otherwise. And it was interesting in that every time we went into the hotel, we had to go through this security check. I was like, boy, they are really careful about uh, customers here. Well, it turned out that one of the people staying in the hotel was Joe Biden's sister. So they were very interested in security. I never saw her and not sure I would recognize her even if I did. Now, a sidewalk may seem like a strange thing to take a picture of, but beautiful 
smooth marble is not your usual sidewalk. So I thought this was pretty neat. The uh, hotel is on one side of kind of a central square. And on one of the other sides is the parliament building. This is a tomb to an unknown soldier, not a particular soldier, but to all people unidentified who were killed in Greek wars, uh, maybe a particular war, I'm not sure of that. And there are guards there at all times, and there's a changing of the guard every hour, which is a big tourist attraction. And we were told that these guards are trained in pairs so that they know each other so well that their movements are perfectly coordinated. And you may notice the shoes that they have on have these big pom-poms on the toes. That's one of the things that you could buy in the tourist stalls, which I did not choose to get. But they uh, walked very straight-legged with arm raised, with a hand at a particular angle. And somebody was wondering if that's where John Cleese got the idea of the Ministry of Silly Walks, because that's pretty much what it looked like. We used this, um, well, I guess that man was there. We, used, we had a bus that uh, gave us kind of a tour of the city. This is the Olympic Stadium that was built for the 2004 Olympics that were in Greece and is still being used, particularly for rock concerts, I think. A modern. The trip that we took after we had kind of toured the city was kind of up along the East Coast and to the Temple of Poseidon, which this is a reconstruction of. It was originally built in the fifth century BCE destroyed, rebuilt, destroyed, rebuilt. So um, I'm not sure when this was done and there is no statue of Poseidon because that also was destroyed. I particularly took a picture of this to show my grandson because he's very interested in some stories, of, um, fictional stories of, that are a lot about Greek gods. The um, Kind of cult of Poseidon, you see a lot. Apparently, in ancient history, there was uh, a possibility of the large city in Greece having patrons in these uh, gods, and Poseidon and Athena were the two that were the possibility. So there was a contest, and Poseidon took a rod and struck the ground, and salt water burst forth. He's the god of the sea. Athena took a rod and touched the ground, and an olive tree grew and bloomed, which was much more fruitful for the uh, Greeks. And so Athena became the patron goddess of the city, uh, and Poseidon was not very happy about that. After those tours, we took the ship, La Bougainville, it's a, obviously a French ship, and I never could get far enough away to get the whole ship in one picture. So you have to see it in chunks. It held about 160 passengers. And I think I mentioned that I was part of an Iowa, alumni, oh, Iowa State Alumni Association group. There were only 11 of us and there were lots of other alumni, mostly alumni association groups that completed the passengers on the ship. And this is my cabin, which was very nice. There's also through the curtains, a balcony with a table and a chair, really nice. And I had no time to sit out there and enjoy life because we were pretty busy. Uh, to the left, which you can't see in the picture, is a small room where there's a sink and um, the shower and the, the next small room has a uh, toilet in it. Very compact and uh, very comfortable. The first place uh, as the tour started was to the city of Volos 
And this is actually a, a city on um, essentially the mainland. We anchored in this port and took a bus to Meteora because there are lots of old monasteries in this area. This picture shows how these monasteries got started. There are lots of holes in these rocks. Um, one of the things that surprised me about Greece, I didn't realize how mountainous it is. And so there's, there's not much soil. I'm surprised in some places that anything grows. And you can see some of the holes in there and where there were monks fleeing from whatever persecution was happening, they hid in these caves. This is a view from one of the monasteries that we visited and you can see across the valley, uh, kind of toward the left that there's another monastery up there. There were 24 monasteries at one time and there are only six remaining and we visited, I think it was three. I was kind of intrigued by the term Meteora because it sounds a lot like meteor. And so I looked up and Meteora means elevated or in the clouds. And you can see that we're at a high enough altitude that the mountains in the distance really are in the clouds. So meteor, the English word means something in the air. And the town of Meteora gave that uh, concept its name. So we did visit uh, some of these monasteries and those little figures in the middle there are people walking up the ramp, um, kind of like, uh, <coughs> excuse me, switchbacks when you're driving up a mountainside, only we were walking on a ramp to get to the monastery at the very top. So this is another example of, you really needed to be in pretty good shape to do a lot of walking. I thought this was kind of an interesting way to get a feeling for what it must have been like <clears throat> to build these monasteries in the first place, which took many, many years. And these were done originally in the 14th through the 16th centuries. So they had to draw everything up in baskets and gather the supplies at the top and then do the construction. And they're built essentially right on the rock. So uh, every place needs restoration. And they were doing re restoring of part of this monastery area. Um, get a great view from the top. The next place that we visited was the island of Delos, which I had actually never heard of before. And apparently it was a very busy trading center at one time. It's supposed to be, that is the legend says that Delos is the birthplace of Apollo and Artemis. Uh, Apollo, the God of the sun, Artemis, the God of the hunt among other things. And I thought it was interesting. I was hearing an article the other day about the space program and NASA had the Apollo program. And now the next uh, group of people that are supposed to go to the moon are the Artemis crew. Apollo and Artemis were twins. They were children of Zeus. This island is pretty much in ruins, although you can see that they had uh, pretty impressive construction because these, some of these buildings are at least two stories, but there is not much left. This is one of the houses where they discovered this mosaic and it's under the process of restoration. And I was impressed how large it is. And part of it is in really very good shape. But the um, tiles that make up the mosaic are tiny. So constructing some of those in the first place was quite a job. One of the, oops, that's, I'm sorry. I forgot I had that one. This is um, a, a walkway in the town and these would have been walls along the side and you can't see it now, but where that thin plaster is would have been brightly painted. And so it would have really been a very colorful city at one time. I'm kind of surprised that some of that plaster is still there, although 
Not very much. And this is the theater. We did not have any performance here. It was just, this is where the theater used to be. And most of this is in ruins. Although in the center, to the left of the woman who's taking a picture and she has a shawl on, you can sort of see a seat with a curved back. So the construction of this theater resulted in something that was, and they were pretty comfortable to sit in. And I can't remember in how many, um, probably thousands of people these theaters held. You can see over to the left, the blocks that are part of it at one time. And once things get jumbled up, it's a little hard to tell, to put back together, to restore something where the pieces originally fit. After Delos, we went to Potmos, which is the legendary place where John was given the, uh, the revelation that he wrote that became the last book of the Christian Bible. And so there is this plaque that says the holy cave of the apocalypse. I was on the island of Potmos. And there is a monastery built on this site. We were grateful that they had ramps and sidewalks so that we didn't have to climb a lot of stairs. There um, are obviously several levels and we walked through some of it, but some of it was deemed so holy that all we were allowed to do is look in the door. So it's hard to get a good picture when you can't get inside the room. And there were always lots of other tourists in the way. We went next to Rhodes and the guide made a big point of saying in Greek, it is Rhodos and Rhodes is the Anglified version, which the Greeks aren't always really happy about. I did get a map of Rhodes and I don't know if I can show the camera and you at the same time. The point being that the island itself is kind of shaped like a dolphin. So we saw a lot of artwork that had dolphins as a theme. And here was one of the many mosaics uh, restored in the castle that have that dolphin theme. This is the restored palace of the Grand Masters. The Grand Masters were the leaders of the Knights Hospitaller, which are a, and I don't remember how old that organization is. This um, castle was destroyed and rebuilt and it was in, I think Mussolini restored it. And it's in really pretty good shape now. There are, in this main town of Rhodes, which is on the northern tip of the island, uh, quite a few houses of worship, which had sometime have been Christian. And then when the Muslims take over, then it's Muslim and then the Christians take over again. So they go back and forth. I think at this point, this is a, as a Muslim sanctuary. And one of the places we pass by is this Kind of touristy, but it's a nice reminder that this was uh, a, an area built up by these Knights of St. John. Santorini was actually my favorite place, and I don't know if any of you saw the show that I ran across and uh, sent to Jonathan, and I think you sent it out to the group because it has much better pictures in it than I was able to take. But we uh, anchored in the harbor and went ashore in uh, smaller boats and then went up the hill because the anchorage is in a very, there's not, there's not really a beach, it's kind of a very small port and a very steep hill. Uh, the bus took us up and we were on our own for the rest of the afternoon. And then you could go back down somehow or other. You could walk down Walking down is actually easier than up. Or you could take a donkey ride down, or you could take a cable car. 
And I was uh, running a little late because I'd done some shopping. So I took the cable car, which I thought was by far the easiest way to go. One of the things that seemed a little sad to me is at the bottom, huge crowd of tourists waiting to go up. And this was four o'clock in the afternoon. So when you're on these really big ships and you come to one of these small towns, you spend half your time or maybe more waiting to go to the site that you're trying to see. And we were there early enough in the day that we really avoided that. But I kind of wondered how many of those folks actually got to see anything. We um, were actually bused to another part of the island of Santorini. And this is the modern um, excavation site. And they have built this marvelous visitor center. There's essentially no energy used because it's open air and lots of places for the light to come in. And one of the reasons I chose this particular picture is this is the guide showing us on her tablet, the island of Santorini. And I think you can sort of see that it's almost circular in shape, but not complete circle. And then the, a blob in the middle because it was an island, volcanic island, which all of these are. And the volcano erupted in about 1450 BCE and apparently was a flourishing civilization at that time, but it left yards and yards deep of ash. And so the whole thing was forgotten and only rediscovered in more recent times when I think the story was that um, people were mining that ash to use in cement on one of the other islands and they started finding pottery. And so they've started the excavation. It's quite extensive and is supposedly maybe a third of, oh, I'm sorry, not a third, a 30th of the site that was actually there. So this was a large uh, civilization center and the uh, um, excavation so far has 40 buildings uncovered. There are, I'm not the greatest photographer, so I have some pictures that aren't really very interesting but a couple of things I really liked. There's um, obviously multi-story buildings and you can see the pottery on the second shelf. So a lot of things were intact. This was called sometimes the Minoan Pompeii because of all of the discoveries about life that are there, but there were no human remains or animal remains discovered. So apparently there was enough notice that people could leave and there was no loss of life but they certainly left a treasure of civilization behind. Uh, to the right and the, the, the right upper edge of the window, you can see a little thing that's poking out. And that is part of the, uh, essentially the sewer system. They, and this is another pipe that runs along, had a, a fascinating sewer system worked out. They had uh, hollowed out, clay or in some cases tree trunks that went from the various houses to a central collector and that ran downhill. So all the sewage ran down to the sea and collected the waste from each house. So it was pretty sanitary arrangement. And you can see how many layers of stone it takes to build that up. Part of what gives information about what the civilization is like is the frescoes that were discovered. And a number of them have been moved to a museum. It's not a big one yet because they haven't been working at this site for too long. But this one of the fishermen is probably, or at least one in best condition that we saw. And it um, shows pretty good catch there for the fishermen's uh, daily catch. And there's this one, which is in really bad shape, and you may not be able to see what's there, but it is a, a, a goddess and women to the left offering some things to this goddess. The thing that's fascinating to me is there are uh, designs on the clothing. You can see textures and colors. The women figures have different hairstyles. They are wearing jewelry and earrings, and they have makeup on. 
uh, you wouldn't know this was from four to 6,000 years ago. So I thought it was very impressive. The last site that we saw is Naphleon, which is actually part of the Peloponnesian um, area. It's not supposed to be called a peninsula. And this is in southwestern Greece. We anchored at Naphleon and then drove to Mycenae. And we did a lot of walking and they told us here was a king's palace and this, but there really wasn't much in the way of ruins and I couldn't figure out how to, to take any good pictures. So this is a tomb that is immense and was apparently looted because there were some signs that it was a queen's tomb, but there was nothing left to modern discoverers. But um, I took this picture of the inside because I think that's uh, for 1200 BC, a pretty impressive structure. At this particular location, we also went to the Museum of Epidurus, where there were statues and pieces from the sanctuary of Asclepius, the healer god. So there was apparently whatever uh, was a hospital or a teaching center there, but uh, the, I was a little um, not impressed with that site, uh, particularly with the guide who took us there, told us about it, and then disappeared. So there was never an opportunity to ask any questions about it or to find out uh, more about the site, more about the history. There were some sections that the map shows that we didn't ever see. But all in all, it was a really neat trip. I very much enjoyed it. And um, well, um, I, I guess that's pretty much it. Are there any questions, Anita? Just a, just a second. Oh, pardon me. So the Thank people you. on Zoom can. Yeah, uh, Anita Tebby. Uh, first of all, that was fantastic. And I, I told uh, Pat before this uh, presentation, and she has traveled uh, worldwide many times, um, and I'm jealous of that, but I want to try to follow in her footsteps. But I have never been to Greece, and you are um, making me want to go even more. Thank yeah. you. Beautiful But be sure pictures. you go to Santorini if you go. I will. I heard that was your favorite. Thank you. Uh, just two basic questions. Um, what was the weather like, and um, what about people speaking English? Did a lot of people speak English? Well, certainly all the guys that we have uh, had spoke English. And I was impressed at the training system they have. You can get a graduate degree in tourism. And these people, there are so many details, dates and numbers of people and what this culture did. And some of these people are certified to lead guides, uh, to be guides all over Greece, which I find really amazing. Um, most of the signs in places where they're of interest uh, are in both languages, English and Greece, English and Greek. Um, there were, well, we weren't ever out. I take that back. The first two days we were there, several of us went out to find some local food and go to some Greek restaurants and get some real Greek food. Because once we got on the ship, being a French ship, there were a lot of French things. All the wines were French. So when we were on the mainland before we left, I was glad that we had gotten some Greek food we stopped at one place where they offered the Greek house wines, which were really good. Um, but even in the restaurants, of course, it was in the central city where they have lots of tourists. There were always English speaking people. Some of the menus, though, at the restaurants were just in Greek, mm -hmm. but they would translate. Yeah. And did you comment on the weather? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, this was October. My son, who lives in London, had been to Greece, but in the summertime, and it was very, very hot. So that's one of the reasons I liked this trip because I figured, well, October should be a good month. And it, and it really was. Uh, there was a picture of me in that one slide and I just wore uh, a light shirt. I think I had a light jacket that I used some of the time, but it was very comfortable. <clears throat> and one day there might've been a little bit of rain, 
but for the most part, it was very clear. That's a good time to go. I was there in October, I think it was 2017. And it was a wonderful trip. I'd been to Santorini and, and those white, blue and white structures is wonderful. Um, I had a question when you were at the Acropolis and, and you, you had a picture of the marble in, in Athens. Did, was it really slippery to walk on? And then climb, climbing up to the Acropolis, they, at the very top, a lot of people were having trouble slipping and you know they were holding on to each other because it was very slippery. Did you well, find that? I didn't find it to be slippery, but then it was not wet at all. And that may be part of it. Well, it wasn't wet. It was just slippery from all the people walking, you know, that makes it slippery because yeah, of- I, I really didn't notice that. It was more hang on to somebody who is okay. I mean, I have had a knee replacement, so I want to be really careful that I don't damage my knee again. And the uh, steps are uneven and not always uh, as smooth as that. So it's not slippery. It's a matter of be careful you don't sprain your ankle. Yeah. And did you go up to the very top of it? Right. Yeah. We had to walk from the, where the bus led us off to the uh, Parthenon. Yeah. Did you go to the Mars, the, the Mars one that, um, that was not too far from there? No, we just walked around the Parthenon and it was so crowded that I was trying to see some other things. And um, being a short person, if I wasn't in front, I couldn't see anything. So I finally decided because we had an appointment at a certain time to meet at the Acropolis Museum. So we didn't have a whole lot of time up at the top of the Acropolis. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a wonderful trip. What year did you go? Just last fall. Okay, good. Any other questions from in the room here or online? Pat, Pat. we were, uh, Mark and I were uh, in Greece at about the same time as Pat was. So um, we found, Mark was just saying. In regard to the question about slipperiness at the Acropolis, approaching going up into the um, the, the Acropolis before the, the the path was a little bit slippery but it was very slippery at my city at the King's Palace I don't know if Pat found this or not but there was a very mm -hmm. steep grade that was the stones were worn slick by the shoes that's interesting I really didn't notice that problem wherever we went I guess it's something you ought to be aware of though a uh, pant. Um, in regard to the monasteries, um, are they just tourist sites, no, or are they alive and well? Active sites, but very few um, monks there. And I, my understanding is they're pretty old, so I'm not sure how long they will continue to be active sites of of residence. But um, probably they will continue to be tourist sites because tourism is the main income for Greece. Okay, and and. Um, you might have said this at the beginning. Was this the first tour um, cruise you've been on, or have you been on a number of cruises? We went on uh, a Viking cruise in Europe some years ago. We went on a sailing ship in the French Polynesia at one time. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not interested, well, neither was Bob, interested in going on a floating city to somewhere. So going on the, the big, I can't even remember all the names of the carriers, uh, Carnival, et cetera, it's just not something I've ever been interested in doing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So did you fly to Athens and you had a tour there and then you boarded a ship in Athens to go to the islands and come back to Athens? Is that what you did? Right. And what ship were you on for the, through the Mediterranean? La Bougainville, I showed pictures of it earlier in the... In the yeah. uh, what was the cruise line, though? What was the name of the cruise line? Um, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, there was a name. Sorry, I, I don't remember. Any, any other questions? Where was the photograph that's on the screen right now taken? Well, I always like to end presentations with a sunset. So I just took sunset pictures whenever there was a pretty one. So I don't actually remember where this one was. Were you by any chance at Crete? 
No. Okay. When we left Crete in the afternoon, leaving Suda Bay, it looked a little bit like that. Yeah, there were some very it's pretty sunsets. Similar to that. <laughs> well, it is a very pretty sunset. You, you accomplished what the task. One of the people in this tour group was complaining one day about how rough the sea was. Well, you can see in that picture how rough it is. And I don't know what in the world she was expecting. I mean, the, the Mediterranean is a sea and the, there was not much wind and there were not much waves. It sounded like she wanted to cruise in a swimming pool. <laughs> I thought it was great. Is there anything that you would have liked to have seen when you were in Greece that you didn't have the chance to see? Hmm, I don't know. I thought about that. We didn't get to the northern part of the country, and I guess there are some interesting things there. Um, a lot of people that um, I know in, in church groups like to go to the sites that have some significance in the New Testament, um, but that was not a part of this. I mean, it was almost $9,000 as it was. <laughs> You said you've been to the British Museum, so have you seen some? I'm sorry, I'm not hearing, John. Uh, did you say you have been to the British Museum where they had some of the artifacts from mm -hmm. Athens? Yeah, I have a son who lives in London, so I've been to the British Museum. Okay. Seen the Rosetta Stone. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>